We're going to begin reading with verse number 38. Matthew chapter 12, beginning with verse number 38. Then certain of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it, but to the sign of the prophet Jonah. Think about that just for a minute. They said, we'll see a sign. And he said, an even adulterous generation seeks after sign. What did he say? There shall no sign be given to it. You need to think about that scripture every time you run around and somebody's saying, I saw a halo on a statue of an angel or I seen oil flowing out of a statue or I seen the sun make an image on a wall. He said, there'll be no sign given. These people will be deceived. That's just a tidbit there. It just hit me as I was reading it. There'll be no sign given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. Because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, Behold, a greater than Jonah is here. And the church said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated this morning. <clears throat> I want to use a thought just for a few minutes there. The words of Jesus as he spoke in verse number 41. When he says, The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. He's telling us that one of the most wicked Cities that existed on the face of the earth will rise in judgment with this generation and condemn it. Think about that. What was he talking about? Who were the Ninevites? <coughs> you remember the story of the Ninevites. They were of the Assyrian people. And the most common story that you'll probably remember is the story of Jonah. The Bible tells us that God sent Jonah to Nineveh to minister, to preach a message of judgment to that city. But you remember what Jonah did. He didn't want to go to Nineveh. He knew how them people were. And he didn't want to go there. Matter of fact, they were arch enemies of Israel. And uh, Jonah literally would have preferred the judgment of God to destroy them than for God to have mercy upon them and spare them. So God sends Jonah to Nineveh with a message and uh, Jonah does not want to go so he hides and he buys a ticket to a ship going to Tarshish. And he gets in that ship and the Bible tells us that he goes down in the bottom of the ship and that God, remember that it was God that sent a great storm upon the sea. Can I tell you this morning, everything that goes on in your life, it may not be what you want it to be. You may not be where you want to be at, but can I tell you that there is a God that is in charge of everything that is going on in your life. Amen. The good, the bad, and the ugly. He may not be responsible for certain things in your life, but I tell you, He controls everything that is going on. The Bible said God sent a great wind and a storm upon this sea. The Bible tells us that Jonah, they had to go find him. These men were getting tore up, and it said it was such a storm that the ship threatened to be broken in half. And they were running around. Now, these were pagan men, and they believed that if the weather was uh, messed up like that and treacherous, that somebody had offended a God and they all begin to search and they went down in the bottom of the ship and where did they find Jonah? They found him asleep. Now this is not my message this morning but this did dawn on me as I was reading the scriptures again this morning how that the people that did not know
know God were scurrying in times of trouble looking for a God to answer their prayer while the person that knew God was fast asleep in the middle of a treacherous storm. It reminds me of the church in the day in which we're living. Men that don't even know God are talking about the end of days wondering if there is a God out there seeking for somebody to give them insight about a God that may be in control of this while the church lays asleep while the world is in turmoil. It's time to wake up and do the job that God has called us to do today. They wake Jonah up and they say this great storm is going. Maybe somebody's offended at God. Where are you from? What's your occupation? What do you, what do, you do? And Jonah got up and he said, I'm the cause. He said, God, I'm a man of God. I believe God and God sent me to go to Nineveh. But I refused and hid down here. And they said, uh, what do we need to do to appease this God? And he said, throw me over the ship. Well, even these pagan men were morally right in their mind because they didn't want to uh, destroy this man's life. They didn't want to throw him over the sea. They knew he would die if they threw him over the sea. And uh, so they tried everything. The Bible said they rolled harder, but the storm got worse. And finally they uh, said that uh, they got to the place that there was going to be no appeasement to this God. But the man of God said the only way to appease him was to throw him overboard. So they throw Jonah over into the sea. And the Bible said that immediately the storm calmed down. You know the story, God not only prepared a great wind, not only did God prepare a storm, but the Bible said that God prepared a great fish. Yes, a great fish that swallowed Jonah up. And the Bible tells us in the, the, about the third chap, second chapter of Jonah, uh, we know by his prayer that Jonah enters in down into the belly of the whale and, and those acidic gastric juices of the whale are burning his skin. He said, I had seaweed wrapped around my head. It was taking me down into Hades, down into the place of death. I knew I was going to die. And Jesus said that he was there three days and three nights in the belly of this fish. And as Jonah is there in the belly of this fish, he is praying and calling out to God and he said I know that you're a God of mercy I know that you're a God of grace and if I will look toward the temple and pray I know you'll be merciful and sure enough God was and he caused that fish to vomit Jonah out upon the dry land hallelujah to God today and in the second chapter of the book of Jonah the very first verse it said in Jonah heard the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time and he told him that you can run from God as long as you want to but if God has given you a word and if God has given you a mission you can run for 20 years but when you come back it's going to be the same message it's going to be the same mission until the will of God is performed so now Jonah gets the second word of God to go to Nineveh. And the Bible said he entered Nineveh in a day's journey. I don't know how far away he was, but I believe he was moving on this time. He enters into Nineveh in a day's journey. And the Bible said that the city of Nineveh was a great city, a three days journey. In other words, it would take you three days to go across the whole city of Nineveh. And it was a wicked city and a mean city. And they were enemies of the nation of Israel. One interesting fact is that you will find all the prophets of Israel, the prophets of God prophesied within the realm of Israel, within the realm of Jerusalem and uh, Judah. And if you remember, Israel and Judah, they were split in half. The nation was divided in the northern kingdom, which was Israel, and the southern kingdom, which was Judah. And all the prophets from Isaiah to Malachi would prophesy within the bounds of this nation. But uh, they would prophesy about other nations. They would prophesy to other nations. But usually it was within the bounds of the nation of Israel. But Jonah, there was an exception with Jonah. God sent Jonah outside of Israel and sent him down to a wicked city, Nineveh, to preach to that city that total ruin and destruction was coming in 40 days. Could you imagine this man of God coming into the city? I believe he had a little trot to his step because he was is ready to obey God. I, I tell you, spend three days and nights I, in the belly of hell, you'll be ready I, when you come out of that place to do what God has called you to do. So can you imagine this 
old guy running into the city when he gets into the city of Nineveh. The Bible said that he comes into the city of the, in the city of Nineveh and he cries out, 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. That's all he said. He runs through the city. Now, I don't know if you'd be a religious person or not, but if you looked out your window and saw this fellow that had been bleached white by the gastric juices of this whale's belly with seaweed wrapped around his head and his eyes bulging out, shouting, the city is going to be destroyed. I think you would start thinking twice about how religious you were. Amen? Amen. But he got somebody's attention. He got somebody's attention. Now, there's some things about the Ninevites that I want to point out before we close. Nineveh under Jonah was a reproof to Jerusalem in the day of Jesus. And I believe it's a reproof to our generation today. Jesus said that the Ninevites will rise in judgment with this generation. He's talking about his own generation in that day, but I believe it applies to the generation in which we live. And he said not only will they rise in judgment with this generation, but they'll condemn it. This wicked, evil, adulterous ravenous people. They wouldn't take prisoners of war. They would annihilate them. Cut their head off. I mean, they were mean, uh, vulgar people. And uh, uh, and uh, that's why the most of the, the prophets uh, disliked them. That's why that, that was the cause of Jonah hating them so much. They were arch enemies of Israel and they were some of the meanest people upon the face of the earth. But Jonah runs through the city and he's shouting, 40 days! And uh, this place is going to be overthrown. He just kept going through the city 40 days. And Nineveh is going to be overthrown. God is bringing judgment upon this city. But I want to look at the men of Nineveh. The Bible tells us that they repented. They confessed to God. They repented. And God spared them. And they turned to the Lord. But I want to look at some of their situation and why they will condemn this generation. First of all, the call to come to God was not many. They were a wicked city. They didn't know anything about God. Apparently, they didn't know about serving God. They didn't know anything about worshiping God. Until all of a sudden this guy comes to the city telling them it's going to be destroyed. That there is a God out there that is going to bring judgment and total ruin in 40 days. Whatever it was about that message, they believed it. Everybody in the town got together. It was a universal day of salvation for the city of Nineveh. They all came to the Lord that day. Why would it condemn this generation? Because they only had one voice. They only had one preacher. They only had one man and it was a message of judgment. We've got a generation of butterflies and snowflakes uh, that the message of the gospel is preached every day on every channel, on every form of media today. You hear it everywhere, even on secular radio and television. There's words of the gospel that are going forth uh, and we've got a generation that refuses to repent. They've got the gospel running out their ears uh, and Jesus said this Ninevites will rise and condemn this generation in judgment. You see, the Ninevites didn't enjoy any privileges like we have in the United States. We've got grand churches that we can come into. We've got music in our sanctuaries, air condition that don't feel like it's working today. But we're blessed. Is it working, Mary? Mary Bell, is it working? <laughs> I can always check Mary. She let me know. <laughs> but we have been so blessed with the gospel. And we hear it every day. And even some of the church gets sick of hearing it. And they've only had one prophet. And as a matter of fact, he wasn't one of the greatest ones there ever was. You ever seen some preachers? Oh, it doesn't need to be easy when I ask this. <laughs> you ever seen... Some preachers, sometimes you thought, why, why did God call them? Why don't he just take them out of here? I don't need to know the answer, especially if you're looking this way. Smiling. Yeah, it's like that one old guy, he said, uh, everybody in my church, he said, I made all the people in my church happy. Some's happy when they see me come, some happy when they see me leave. Yeah. 
But Jonah, he wasn't the nicest guy. He wasn't the friendliest guy. He wouldn't be your modern 2022 pastor. <laughs> Just lovey and dovey and his cheeks rosy and loves everybody. And, you know, this generation, many of our ministers, we, we've lost that masculinity, that, that, that power of the gospel that goes forth. And I'm not saying it's only for men, but there needs to be a power of the gospel. Jesus said we studied in our Sunday school lesson this morning. He said you'll receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come. There's got to be a little power with our punch, a little power with our message. If nobody feels what we're preaching, if you don't feel what you're preaching yourself, you might be preaching the wrong sermon. Hallelujah. Preachers running around every day trying to get everybody to feel accepted. Try to get everybody to uh, be happy the way they are. Be comfortable living in their sin and, and uh, probably sip tea with their pinky stuck out and somebody said probably got lace on their drawers. <laughs> well this wasn't Jonah. This wasn't Jonah. Matter of fact he called for the judgment of God. He went and sat and built a little hut and sat and watched for it. He was ready for the fire to fall. I can't wait till the fire of God falls on that bunch of heathen hypocrites down there. That's what he did. Yeah. And he wasn't nice when he presented the sermon. <laughs> but you know God calls all different kinds of people from all different walks of life. I've heard people say, you know, this one guy, boy, he could preach, but he was the hatefulest man in the world to ever get along with. <laughs> some of them college educated, some of them dumber than bricks. You got a variety of people. <clears throat> so don't get hung up on the messenger because God used God use anything. Yes. He used you, don't he? Yes. He'll use anything. Yes. God used Jonah, even though he wasn't the grandest of preacher, not one of the best that there ever was. They didn't hear no <clears throat> glad tidings. You know what? Matter of fact, they didn't even hear him say, if you'll repent, God will have mercy. He didn't preach no gospel of repentance. You cannot find in the four chapters of the book of Jonah anywhere where Jonah told the people to repent. He preached a message of judgment. Judgment of God is coming. And even with that harsh message, it got down into their heart. And even the king said, we're not going to eat or drink anything. We're going to fall on our face. Maybe, just maybe this God, but they didn't have no promise of forgiveness. And Jesus said the Ninevites will rise in judgment and condemn this generation because greater than Jonah is here. Yes, amen. They'll condemn this message even though the, they'll condemn this generation even though the message of the prophet was not encouraging. He didn't give no promise of pardon. He didn't give no promise of repentance. Of forgiveness. He didn't even make mention of repentance. He didn't, he, he didn't even offer any hope that if they did repent, something good would happen. He preached the judgment of God with final doom. God is sending judgment upon Nineveh. It's going to be overthrown. His message began and ended with a threatening. He mentioned their end was soon to come. Forty days. Forty days. There are those that hear the teaching of Jesus and then we've heard the gospel message and we've heard it from the power of God's word. We've even heard the preaching about a man where they said never of a man spake like this man. Hallelujah to God. The power of the words of Jesus. We're able to rehearse the words of the Messiah. Jesus himself in church on Sunday morning. And, and we come in where we're, many times we're unconcerned. We're not interested. That's why the Ninevites will rise in judgment. Because when the voice of God was heard through the prophet. It didn't make no difference what color he was. What kind of education he had. Didn't matter what kind of school he went to. Or what denomination he preached at. When they heard the word of the living God, they repented. Hallelujah to God. Today I'm taking this time. We need to stop trying to look pretty and preach the word of the living God. Only God and his spirit can drive me into repentance today. Amen. Jonah wasn't no helper to the repentance. He wasn't no tender loving preacher. He hated most of them. He, he, he hated all of them. But he even disliked the ministry that God had called him into. And he probably uh, dis discharged the message 
in a mean, hateful spirit. But you know, God uses all of us because it wasn't Jonah's preaching that saved the men. It was God's spirit that convicted their heart and made them turn to him. God just wants us to make mention of him. God just wants us to make the world aware of him. That was Israel's mission. It's the mission of the church to make the unbeliever out there to recognize there is a God out here. And God said, you make them aware of me, I'll do the rest. Because you can't save anybody. He didn't pray for them. He didn't give them no prayer of love and pity. He was, matter of fact, displeased when God spared them. But these people obeyed God's voice and they got the mercy of God through listening to God's warnings. Hallelujah to God. And does the warning of God itself not imply the mercy of God? God didn't have to send Nineveh a warning. He was going to destroy them. All he had to do was destroy them. He don't have to give you and me warnings that he's going to destroy us, warnings of what's coming upon the world. He didn't have to give us the scripture. But to me, that implies the mercy of God that he gives me an opportunity to get ready. He gives me a chance that I don't have to face the judgment of God. That's why the men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment and condemn this generation because they heard the word. They prepared for the judgment and they were spared from the wrath that was to come. Oh, hallelujah to God today. Jonah was angry just like some of the scribes and Pharisees when they came to Jesus. Remember what, uh, or when they came in John the Baptist, remember what John said? Who has, fle who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? That was John's question to them. Who's warned you? So there is mercy in the warning. Yeah. There was mercy. We see God's mercy in that he warned them of it. And we see how that when Nineveh responded, how great God's mercy is, and God spared them. Their hope of being saved, their hope of escaping doom was very slim. Because the king said, I believe it's in chapter 3, he tells everybody to fast, nobody to eat or drink, don't even feed your animals, don't even feed your chickens. <laughs> don't even feed you the beast. And what the king say? He said, who can tell? Who can tell that God will repent and take back this threat? They didn't even know they could be saved. But they did everything in their power to be saved. They had no revelation of the character of the God of Israel. They didn't know who this God was. When Jonah was on that boat, they asked him, they said, who are you? He said, I'm a servant of God. And he said, matter of fact, my God created the land and the sea. That's what Jonah said. <clears throat> so I believe it spoke to these pagans that when this sea is in uproar and they throw him overboard, the Bible said the sea laid down. You know what them pagans did? Them unbelievers, them people that didn't know God? Those guys on the ship, the Bible said, they believed God. Matter of fact, they got together and had a little, had a little religious service and offered sacrifice to God. Hallelujah to God. That's what God is able to do. That's what God is wanting to do. He's wanting to change men's lives. He's wanting to convince men that he is the God of all creation. Amen. Amen. The argument of these Ninevites was mainly negative. Nothing was said against the repenting. They couldn't be any worse for repenting. They thought, you know, we're going to die anyway. This God's going to send judgment. Repenting ain't going to hurt anything. Now look at this generation. They see no need to repent. They have no desire to repent. <clears throat> and oftentimes it is our churches telling them that God loves them just like they are. Yep. <laughs> that's a dangerous, that's a dangerous statement, a dangerous doctrine. God loves his creation. But I tell you what, God's going to judge sin. Yes, amen. Right. Come to church this morning, I saw one of these billboards. It changes pictures and stuff like that. Got advertisements on it. <coughs> I can't remember <coughs> the exact wording of it, but it was in rainbow colors. It said something about love. 
That's all poor fools. I know what they're doing. They're pushing the homosexual agenda. Fools. Fools. Because you can't have love if you don't have judgment. There's no way that you can love your child and be a person of love and a parent of love without judgment. Because that child runs out into danger and you don't punish that child and you don't rebuke that child. You don't love that child. You see, we want love, but we don't want the judgment. That's not the God we serve. You serve another God. Our God is a God of love. Matter of fact, He don't just love, He is love. But He's also a consuming fire. And he was bringing judgment upon the wicked. But when they repented, God spared them and had mercy on them. Don't we at least have this much hope? Don't we have at least this much hope that the Ninevites had? That if we repent, God will have mercy? I believe there's coming a day. There's coming a day where men will fall on their knees and they will cry out to God. I just hope it ain't too late. Matter of fact, John talks about a day that he's seen in the future that he said they'll run to the rocks and the mountains and cry for the rocks and the mountains to fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits upon the throne for the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? I tell you who will be able to stand. Those Ninevites will be standing that repented. People of God that have repented will be standing. Those that's got their name covered under the blood of Jesus Christ and their sins forgiven. That will be the ones standing in that day. Just like the firing of a cannon. Men fall flat on the ground to escape the bullet. Against such blows, falling is the best safety, and being prostrate before God is your safest position. Oh, that the mercy of God that would fire that cannon and cause us all to run for safety. God, in like manner, warns us before he wounds us. <laughs> He frights us before he fights us. Forty days in Nineveh be overthrown. Let us fall down before the master. And it just might be that he will have mercy on us. Yes. The story ends like this. Jonah goes and he builds him a little hut and he sits there on the east side of Nineveh and he's watching the city. <clears throat> Can't wait for the fire to fall and just burn that place to the ground. He hated these Ninevites. Funny thing about church people, we love everybody as long as they're like us and when they do what we want them to do. But how we feel hatred in our heart for those that are of a different color or those that are different than us, even those that are in sin. I mean, these people were wicked sinners. They were terrorists in that day. And I know that people, I know we preach against sin, but folks, I know people that I care a great deal about, that they don't live a good lifestyle. And just because people are in sin, just because they're drunks, alcoholics, dope addicts, homosexuals, perverts, gays, and lesbians, we may not accept that lifestyle. But let us guard our heart that we're not like Jonah, that we hate them. Amen. As Jonah sat there watching for God to destroy it, the Bible said that God made a gourd come out and grow over top of Jonah and, and it was to keep him out of the heat. Jonah was so happy. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah to God. He was singing and shouting just like a Sunday morning service. And the Bible said that the next morning, God caused the east wind to blow and a lot of heat. And he caused, he, he caused a worm to come and eat that gourd. The gourd dissolved, and there sat Jonah, sweating like a dog, burning up in the heat. And Jonah was mad. And God said, Jonah, do you, are you right in your heart to be mad? And he said, well, yeah, this gourd gave me shield from the heat. And God said, you didn't create the gourd. You didn't create the worm. But you feel more sorry for the gourd than you do people created in my image. The story is about Jonah on the surface, but underneath, it's about God, Amen. the creator of the universe, the one that controls all things in land and in sea, right. 
The God that brings things in our life that he may turn us to perform his will. The God that has mercy on the wicked and those that don't deserve mercy. Thank God today he gives mercy today. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah to God. Jesus said these Ninevites will rise in judgment and condemn this generation because they heard one old hateful preacher that hated them preach a message of doom and they repeated, repeated, but you've got the Savior of the world that's about to hang on the cross and you won't even give him the time of day. I'm telling you, today is a day that we need to check ourselves and be ready to meet the Master. And the only way we'll be ready for that is not joining a church or joining a club or being part of a denomination. It's doing just like this king and these Ninevites did. Fall on your knees, repent, repent turn away from your evil, and start living for God. Amen. Will you stand with us all over the house? <coughs> As they come to the music this morning.